What if you just didn't need a giant tower and instead you could use a little system just like this and still do things like run all of your office apps as much as you want and also this little mini PC has an eight core processor that will turbo over five gigahertz. It can play popular esports titles without needing a dedicated GPU because of the new integrated graphics. It also has features like two two and a half gig ethernet ports, Wi-Fi, two NVMe PCI Gen 4 slots and a whole host of other features that really beg the question, why do you need a giant desktop anymore? So let's get to it. Hey guys, this is Patrick from STH and this is the B-Link GTR7. Now on STH, we've done independent reviews of the GTR5, the GTR6, and now this GTR7, I can say, took all the feedback that we had from the previous gen units and made something that is absolutely special. So in this video, we're gonna take a look at the hardware because there's a lot of innovation here. We're also gonna show you some, uh, some things that work and don't work. We're then gonna go and look at things like the performance, power consumption, and also the noise, which I think they did a great job with on the system. And then I wanna get to our key lessons learned. But before we get to all that, I just wanna say thank you to all of the STH YouTube members who allowed us to go and purchase this with their support. If you wanna support us, you can always click join down below. And by supporting us, it allows us to do things like buy these units and do really independent reviews, which is why we're gonna show you something that uh, nobody else has talked about that doesn't work. With that, let's get to the hardware. Okay, the first thing when we say mini PC, you kind of expect that it's mini, right? Well, let me just kind of show you this uh, new GTR7. And I think it looks, uh, by the way, very slick. This is just one of the color options. There's also like gray, this bright orange color. But in terms of size, it's also a lot bigger and not a lot of folks have talked about this. And so this is a 13th gen NUC. And you can just kind of see that this is, uh, this is notably larger than the NUC. But I actually really like that because as much as I like how small the NUC is, the fact of the matter is that you get a lot more, I guess, performance, but also you get a lot quieter system with with us. The other thing that is very noticeable is that this chassis is thicker. And one of the things that we talked about in when we did the GTR6 review is I said, if you could make this a little bit bigger and a little bit quieter, that would be awesome. And so let me just kind of stack these up real quick. So this is the GTR7, the GTR6, and now we're gonna put the GTR5 on top. It might be a little bit hard to tell, but the GTR5 to GTR6, the GTR6 was a little bit thicker and it was also a lot noisier. But now with the GTR7, we have a pretty substantially thicker chassis but on the other hand, uh, they have fixed a lot of the complaints I had on noise. And I just realized it's probably smarter to have these things racked from five, six, seven. So that's what we're gonna use going forward. But I'm just gonna show you this real quickly, what the differences are with this version versus the previous generation. This is a complete new redesign. And from the front, it may not seem like it is because you can see that we still have the power button, clear CMOS button, a type A port, a type C port, a audio jack. I mean, this is pretty much the exact same front that we've had for generations. And the similarities don't really stop there. I mean, because if you look at the side of this, uh, this pretty much looks the same. The other side pretty much looks the same. If we were to go and look at the bottom, uh, these things all pretty much have this exact same bottom bit, except uh, this is the new feature, I guess, on the bottom. But you have the little pull tab, you have the rubber feet, and then you uh, you have this, which tells you how to get into the BIOS. It's kind of a little bit weird. The other feature that is similar is, uh, is the top of this, where we get a nice little fingerprint reader. You can see that we have this on all of the different versions. But that fingerprint reader is on the top of the chassis. And as you're gonna see here, there is a lot of difference between the generations, right? Like this one said B-Link, but it had like some massive light up AMD branding on it. The uh, GTR6, well, that one um, that one had this like replaceable top and we actually used the red top for our YouTube cover and stuff, but I, I like the gray one, so I've just have left that one on. Uh, but then the GTR7, uh, this thing looks awesome, right? This just looks cool. Now looking at the back of this, that is where this gets totally crazy because if you look at this, you'll see that it's kind of like a mashup of the five and also the six six because we get things like on the five where we get HDMI and display port. We also get features from the six, like we get our two USB two and two USB three ports. Going back in time, we also get two LAN ports and these are Intel I225V, which means they are two and a half gig ethernet ports. So on board, you get five gigabits per second of total networking. And if you saw our Asus Store Flash Store 6 review with all those M.2 SSDs, you had two two and a half gig ethernet ports. And what you can do is you can use SMB Direct now. So you don't have to do things like LACP and all that kind of stuff. And you can still use SMB3 multi-channel. And that gives you your full performance really from storage or pretty close to it without having to do anything on the network. You can literally just use an unmanaged switch, turn it on and go. We'll link that review in the description. Next up, we have an additional audio jack. So this is one of the first 
first mini PCs we've seen that has two audio jacks, one on the front and rear. Now, I know you see the two USB 4 type C ports, but we're gonna get to that in a second. So what I wanna do is really talk about this whole power situation, because you're obviously gonna see that here. So if you look at this, you'll see that we have this like new kind of little cutout and we have this like new little, it looks like a button. And so with this unit, you get a little power brick and that has the uh, corresponding side and it's actually magnetic. So you're gonna see, you know, it uh, kind of locks in place there, which is kind of cool. And then when you sit it down, uh, the idea is that the cable can come out here. Now this is new because the old ones just had USB barrel jacks, but frankly, I'm not sure if I even like this solution. Uh, we get a nice hunt key adapter, but the challenge with this is like, how do you get a replacement? This is very proprietary stuff. Okay, really quickly, I wanna talk about the best feature of this unit, or at least the outside of this unit by far, which is the USB 4, because with USB 4, not only do we get fancy USB 4, but we also get Thunderbolt 3 as part of that. And what that means is that we can use external devices like uh, eGPU enclosures that are Thunderbolt enclosures and plug them right in. And that's why when we reviewed the GTR6 Pro, people were like, great, you get four HDMI, but you lost that second network port. And also you don't have USB 4. And that's like a feature that a lot of systems have. The SER6 Pro, when we reviewed that, that did have it. It wasn't as nice as a GTR series. But on the other hand, the fact that it had it was uh, meant that we could actually show you an eGPU. And we're doing the exact same thing here. But there is one challenge, and that's that B-Link does not tell you like, okay, we have three USB type C ports, but they don't actually tell you which ones are Thunderbolt and which ones are uh, are just USB ports. And so what you're gonna see over here is that we have our unit, we have below it our Razer Core X eGPU chassis, and then inside we have an Intel Arc A770 just because we wanted to create an entirely unholy alliance of GPU here. And something you can see behind me is that this is actually running right now. So just real quick, when we tested this, what we found was that the two back USB type C's, those will get us to a working eGPU setup. The front one will not. And so we know that there are two Thunderbolt slash USB 4 controllers on the system. And so it looks like that this one is not the Thunderbolt one or USB 4 one. But using the eGPU and Thunderbolt enclosure, we found something that's uh, kind of a bummer actually. When you plug in the eGPU and you're using the USB 4 Thunderbolt port uh, on the back of this, uh, you might wanna go and log into the system the same way that you would normally do that. And that would be to use the fingerprint. Now you can see that we have the fingerprint sensor set up. And so it's asking us for that in Windows. And um, you're gonna see that absolutely nothing is happening here. We're just, uh, we're doing nothing here. Now this fingerprint reader works no problem when you don't have an eGPU attached, but if you do have an eGPU attached for some reason, it does not work and I don't really know why. One other thing is that sometimes when you disconnect or reconnect the eGPU, you have the system reboot on you. I don't really know why that is on a lot of other systems that doesn't happen, but it is some on like these little mini PCs, you see it happen a little bit more often. It might be because I don't think that the, you know, Intel graphics is actually supported for an eGPU enclosure. So maybe it like works when you plug it in, but when you pull it out, it resets the device. I don't really know why that happens, but it just does. So something to be aware of. And now that we have done that, let's uh, let's see what happens when we use our fingerprint reader, we get right in. So that's the difference of having the eGPU connected versus the not having the eGPU connected. It's just that little fingerprint reader all of a sudden works when we don't have the eGPU installed. Okay, getting onto the bottom of the system, uh, something that B-Link does that I really like is they have these feet. And I was pretty surprised to see that the feet actually match the chassis. It's just a little thing that they're doing. And even the little pull tab, once you've done your four screws, uh, that even matches the chassis, which I think is awesome. And for folks that have been following the series, the Ryzen stickers are still here, but they have been relegated to the bottom of this chassis instead of prominently displayed like on the GTR5. Okay, so now that we have undone our screws, we just open the chassis, super easy. And inside we get a innovation that B-Link does, but a lot of the other mini PC vendors don't do. And this is great. They have a little cooling fan on the bottom of this with a little airflow shroud. And then they have a little heat sink here. And that heat sink, I guess, is supposed to take heat from the NVMe SSDs and give it a little bit somewhere to go. Now, one of the things I don't like about the solution is that if you have your LTT Creator Edition screwdriver, you can't get into the like screws for the shroud. They just require too thin of a screwdriver to be able to get in there. There's only three screws, but they're a pain to get in and out when you do want to service the system. But once you do get the shroud off, the first thing you're gonna see is that because we have that little magnetic DC power jack, um, there's another cable. So it's not just the fan cable, there's a second cable for that DC. But once you get past that small challenge, you're gonna see something that is awesome. There's a lot of labeling, which is just 
a little tiny feature that you see on higher end units, but you don't necessarily see in a lot of mini PCs. So let's talk a little bit about what's in here. The system comes standard with 32 gigabytes of memory, and that means that you get two crucial DDR5 5600 DIMMs. That's just a little bit faster, but it is nice when we have an iGPU to have that extra memory bandwidth. Inside the system, we have an AMD Ryzen 7, which is a pretty fast processor with eight cores and 16 threads. One of the really cool things with this is the fact that we saw this actually go and on CPU-Z hit over five gigahertz. And that means that this is a fast processor that also has a lot of performance. I mean, if you're over five gigahertz on a modern P core, then uh, you know that is just about the best-ish user experience that you're gonna get. Now, now, aside from the crucial memory, we also have a crucial SSD. This SSD is the one terabyte crucial P3 Plus, which is uh, frankly one of the least expensive one terabyte PCIe Gen 4 NVMe SSDs that you can get. There's a P3, which is a little less expensive. P3 is uh, not a very good drive. The P3 Plus is uh, frankly not my favorite, but I mean, I guess, okay. We used the P3 Plus SSDs when we did the Asus Store Flash Store, both the six bay and 12 bay models. So if you wanna see my thoughts on that drive, you can go check out that Asus Store review. Also, Will has done a P3 Plus review on the SDH main site. So you can see it compared to some other drives. The cool thing though, is that this doesn't just have one SSD spot, it actually has two PCIe Gen 4 M.2 slots. So if you want to, you could go put like say two four terabyte SSDs. Now if you did see our B-Link EQ12 Pro review, you're definitely gonna notice that if you install like new SSDs in here, you may not get your Windows 11 Pro license um, easily. I had to go when we did that and actually emailed the support from B-Link and they finally sent me new keys for that N305 unit, but at the same time, uh, I would expect that the experience seems similar here. The support around these things is just not as good as something like a Project Tiny Mini Micro PC. The other thing that you get here though, is you get an Intel AX200, which is a Wi-Fi 6 generation Wi-Fi card. It's good that it's Wi-Fi 6. It would have been nice if it was a Wi-Fi 6 E card, but still not too bad. But the big thing with this is not just the hardware, it's also the performance, power consumption, and noise. So let's talk about the performance first. So first off, I just wanna point out that we are looking at the AMD Ryzen 7, not the Ryzen 9, which is a GTR 7 Pro version. So when we compare that to some of the other older units, just keep in mind that we were looking at like Ryzen 9, like this was the Ryzen 9 6900 HX or something like that in the GTR 6. And so when we look at the performance though, between those two processors, it's actually a pretty huge jump on like everything that we ran. Uh, it's a pretty huge jump with the new architecture. So that was cool in itself. But at the same time, if you're using this as an Office PC, frankly, compared to GTR5, GTR6, you're not gonna wanna upgrade to this because it is a little bit faster, but it's not gonna like be a game-changing level of performance faster. Uh, but, but, but then we talk about the integrated GPU. The integrated GPU in this is an integrated RDNA 3 graphics APU CPU. And you might ask, well, what's the impact of going to RDNA 3? And uh, it's huge actually, and it was actually kind of a funny story. So one fun thing is that when we were setting up the OBS for or League of Legends, something that we had access to was actually recording with the AV1 encode feature. So this now has hardware AV1 encode, which is really cool, especially if you're coming from an older system. It just helps you use smaller file sizes and uh, you know being able to do that GPU offload is awesome. Just to note here, when we do this League of Legends, we're also using OBS to capture so if you are doing something like, you know, you want to stream or something like that, having AV1 encoding really helps. So my thought was that League of Legends is highly relevant just because of how many people play it, but also it tends to run pretty darn well on these mini PCs. And in this case, it ran way better than I expected because I saw that as we were going through the 4K results, everything on very high, we saw the performance was like in, in the lower end, like about 70 something FPS. And then on the high end, like maybe 90, 95 FPS. And so we saw absolutely awesome performance from this. So when we ran 10, 80 on this, we were getting over 100 FPS pretty darn consistently and even into like 120 and what have you FPS. And if you're wondering that previous gen GTR 6, well, that was only doing like maybe 45, 50, 60 FPS, somewhere in there on 4K. And so that was a huge jump just in terms of performance. We're not gonna show the recording of this, but I just wanna tell you that I did try CSGO on this. And this is really starting, this is probably the first mini PC that has an integrated GPU that I think is just about on that borderline where I think it's playable. This little system is able to run generally in about the 140 to 170 FPS range, although there are dips below 120. And then that's when things get a little bit weird with some monitors. 
Now, power consumption and noise are huge these days. And let's talk about how much better this system is. So first off, this is the idle, and I'm gonna be quiet. I'm gonna actually hold this up, but I'm just gonna tell you that this studio is a 34 dBA studio. With this sitting here and the sound meter not too far away, this only gets up to about 34.4 to 35. Okay, and just taking a look at the idle power consumption, we're at about 9.8 watts. Sometimes you'll see it bounce up to about 11 watts, so it's maybe about 9.8 to 11 is what I would use. Okay, so let's put this under load for a little bit, and I just wanna show you this real fast. The power consumption you're gonna see on the entire unit is gonna go up into about that 91 to about 95 watt range. So that is pretty darn significant. Okay, now the fan is spinning up a lot here, but just something that's different between this unit and some of the previous gen units and some of the other just mini PCs that you see is that this thing is running with the CPU consuming 65 watts. The total system is sitting in that 95, 96 watts as that fan spins up. But the clock speed is still sitting between about that 4.6 to 4.7 gigahertz range. So this, that thing is just absolutely jamming right now. So I think one of the advantages of this versus a smaller chassis is just the fact that this has more room for cooling and finally B-Link is taking advantage of that. But noise levels have definitely gone up. This is no longer a silent machine. The decibel meter should be reading somewhere about 46, 47, 47 and a half dBA on our 34 dBA noise floor studio. And I'll let you hear it just so you can. Honestly, what this reminds me of is like a laptop when the fans are like really going because maybe you're doing like video encoding or gaming or something like that. That kind of reminds me of what's going on. Or of course, just Windows Defender is going. From a noise standpoint, this is a huge upgrade over the GTR 6. Okay, for all of these systems, I love to have key lessons learned because we should learn something every time we do one of these reviews, right? And I think uh, in this case, we definitely learned a bunch. So the first thing that is my key takeaway is just the fact that when you go from the GTR5, GTR6 to GTR7, the big upgrade is really, you know, the new graphics that you get here. You definitely get a faster processor, but on CPU performance side, but the GPU I think is much better. Also, I think that B-Link did a great job with the features here. When we did the B-Link GTR6 review, a lot of folks had feedback, which I think is very valid, which is like, hey, it has four HDMI ports, cool, but what I really want is like, you know, USB 4 or Thunderbolt, all that kind of stuff. And I also miss having the two, two and a half gig ethernet NICs. And in this new system, uh, we, we definitely get that. Now from a standpoint of hardware quality, I can tell you that just looking at these units, this new GTR7 is much better than the previous generations. It's getting close to what like an Intel Nook is. It's probably on par or so with this. This is a Geekcom AS6, which I think we're gonna do a review of just on the main site. We're probably not gonna do a video of this one. Also, this thing just looks cool. And I really wish that we had the GTR7 Pro that we ordered in orange, but that one's just uh, not available yet, so we don't. I do wanna be clear though, that there are definitely some differences in terms of support. If you want like firmware upgrades and uh, even things like if you wanna reinstall Windows, um, that's probably gonna be a challenge. Now for the Linux users out there, we did run this with Ubuntu, no problem. The Proxmox side, we just didn't do on this yet. We might do it in a future video, but th since that's also Debian based, I would assume that that would work. But my biggest takeaway is really how much this little platform makes it so that you don't need a giant desktop anymore. Let's face it, you have a processor that can go over five gigahertz. It's relatively quiet. I mean, you can maybe get something that's quieter, but you're gonna spend a lot of money just on the cooling to get something that's quieter than this that has decent performance. The integrated GPU for a lot of folks is all you need. If you're someone that, you know, you don't get to play a lot of games, but maybe you play League of Legends, maybe you play CSGO-ish or something like that. You know, you can do a lot with this system and I think that that's pretty darn awesome. If you're a content creator, Am I a content creator? I don't know. But if you are, you have things like H.264, H.265, and AV1 hardware encode decode. That's something, by the way, that even the Mac Mini does not have because the M2 Silicon just lacks it. Even if you went all the way up to the Mac Pro or Mac Studio, you're still not gonna get hardware AV1, and this system has that. With 32 gigabytes of memory, you could expand that to 64, but I think 32 in this form factor is probably pretty good. And then you have a one terabyte SSD. Now, it would be nice if that was a two terabyte, but also you can just go put a four or two or whatever next to it because you have another slot. I mean, heck, 
there are eight terabyte M.2 SSDs. And since you have your Thunderbolt ports, there are things that we've reviewed like QNAP NASA's that are Thunderbolt based. And so you could put a giant storage array if you really wanted to on this. You could also do things like have an eGPU, you could have a external, you know, NIC or something like that and have 10 gig. I mean, there are a ton of different options. I mean, we're calling this a mini PC and it used to be that mini PC sucked, but this is maybe even overkill for a lot of users. This is now the premium GTR seven. And I think it is a premium system that is more than enough for the vast majority of people out there. Hey guys, I hope you like this review of the B-Link GTR seven. It is definitely one of my favorite reviews that I've done so far and favorite mini PCs. I think this thing is absolutely awesome if you can't tell. And if you did like this video, well, why don't you check out some of our other videos, give this video a like, click subscribe and turn on those notifications so you can see whenever we come out with great new videos. As always, thanks for watching and have an awesome day.